We are in the season after Pentecost, the longest season of the church year. I think it gets longer every year. The season runs from Pentecost, which is 50 days after Easter, all the way to Advent, which is four Sundays before Christmas. And the days are all running together in my book, especially this time of year. We celebrated Pentecost on the last Sunday in May, which seems like an eternity ago. And Advent begins December 3rd, which is right around the corner, seven weeks away. It seems so long, the longest season, a long season in multiple ways. The colors are changing outside, whereas inside we see the same ordinary colors of green. And yet we know there is nothing ordinary about this time. We have been on a long journey, growing impatient with politics, growing impatient with family and friends, perhaps. Growing impatient with church and where is everyone? Growing impatient with new normals post-COVID and not grasping the full impact of those three years on our individual and collective lives. Growing impatient almost to the point of complacency. Then we get to the text like Exodus. When we read and feel the people's anxiousness fear, and anger, we can relate with them. We go through this ritual and tradition of coming to this place of worship, and we wonder, why does this matter? Why do we show up every Sunday? We see the events of our world and wonder why church even matters. Does it help? Maybe the season after Pentecost is so long, because it invites us to slow down and allows us to be a part of a faith-forming time that reminds God's people what matters to God. Nonetheless, it certainly can be a struggle getting out of bed on Sunday morning, or any morning for that matter, especially if we fail to see what matters. Children, youth, young adults, and adults know the dance between firmness and flexibility, don't we guys? Every day they find themselves discerning when to stand firm on what matters, when to bend, and when to stop bending. At some point, each person comes to a place of, de de of declaring, like the character Tevier in the musical Fiddler on the Roof, if I bend that far, I will break. So we all have to come to the point of asking, what is the issue? How do we do church? Our political climate is changing. Our city is changing. Is there ever a constant? Will our exodus end? We look at our biblical ancestors and they struggled with identifying their faith in God within the worshiping community at, and at home in a deeply troubling time. Moses is still up on that mountain, collecting resources from God so that those resources can be shared with the community below. Moses is being filled to the brim with stewardship ideas and evangelism ideas and faith formation ideas and worship ideas, ideas for prophetic witness and learning the ways of meeting people where they are on the road of life, being a collaborator and a convener. The people didn't know that Moses was going to be on that mountain 40 days, and they grew impatient. And even a little bit ornery. How long does it take to get up a mountain, talk to God, and come back? Clearly, Moses must have abandoned them. Therefore, the people of Israel turned to Aaron. Aaron, we need a God to worship. What do you got? Make us a God. And Aaron was not equipped with devotional resources or was having a lapse in recalling newly established rituals and traditions. Aaron didn't have the ability to say, oh, this isn't a good idea. 
nor did he have a clarity in his faith to not be so easily persuaded. What he did have was the memory of what the people would know, and that is by using the form of idols from nature religions of the Near East. The golden calf was a symbol of strength and virility common in religions of that area, and perhaps this would be a way for folks to see reassurance in God's presence. It was the resource that Aaron knew. This was not a terrible resource. It just was not God's resource. The people were tirelessly determined, and they were ornery, and this is what they turned to. We know how this story goes, however. God was not amused with this stiff-necked group of people and wanted to teach them a lesson. You will not form idols in my image. Moses had to talk God down. Moses talked God down from the wrath that God was considering. Moses reminded God of the things these people have been through from Abraham and Isaac and now from being set free from Pharaoh's clutches. God, cut your people some slack. And God's mind was changed because God realized what mattered. What mattered was getting Moses back to the people to preach and teach the resources that were given to him so that the people gathered could live into these resources of faith. And in this instance, the Ten Commandments. We sometimes like to look for the quick fix because we are unclear of the resources available to us as well. We get impatient. We get angry. We think God is not listening. And we sometimes confuse determination with a false idol. As Catherine Z. Johnston writes in her commentary on this, quote, sometimes what really feels like the right decision one that may have been made for all the earthly kingdom right reasons is the wrong one in God's eyes. A godly decision, more often than not, requires time and thought, prayer and discernment, and the willingness to let go of our great idea in order to make room for God's best idea." End quote. How many times have we molded our own golden calf because it was the great idea instead of going back to our core, instead of discerning and even praying? Our feelings get hurt. We become emotional, and that's okay. However, our core is to journey with God and one another as we grow in faith, compassion, and generosity. Our core is to expand our love, include our community, and accept one another in the manner of Jesus the Christ. If this is a core of our being, then we need to talk. We need to celebrate the fact that we are a congregation that has so much wisdom and such a deep faith that spans the generations and spans over a century of existence. We need to hear our faith stories across these generations, especially during this most troubling time, this troubling, bizarre, and painful time. What is the bravest thing we have ever done. How does God speak to us on a daily basis? What gives us courage? These are questions we typically do not ask one another. For as we learn about each other, we grow in faith and with each other we become more passionate about our beliefs and what makes us tick. The young adult wants to know how a 90-year-old goes for a walk every morning and says their prayers. The 85-year-old wants to know how the teenager relates with other teenagers of different races and cultures. Folks, we have so much to learn from one another. We are so equipped. 
Now we just need a lesson on how to use that equipment and how that equipment can be used at home and shared and brought back and shared once again. Let's not look for the quick fix anymore. It's time for us to do more than simply tune in. It's also time for the church to quit blaming its people for not doing anything, especially on this day known as Laity Sunday. Let's look to God from that mountaintop and use our resources to further our faith that is so very vibrant. Let's look to God and make a difference in the world, a world that God did not give up on, nor should we. Let's channel our emotions into something God intended, a community catalyst, connector, convener, creating a space to serve as a prophetic witness. Catherine Johnston shares a story about a podcast featuring David Axelrod and Lynn manuel Miranda. In this podcast, Lynn manuel Miranda, quote, talks about the time Stephen Sodheim visited his high school classroom and told the story about creating the opening of West Side Story. Jets versus Sharks, remember that? Sondheim talked about lyrics that Miranda knew nothing about, and nothing, and didn't even appear in the show. Then he revealed that they had done weeks and weeks of work on lyrics to this one song, only for choreographer Jerome Robbins to say, I can dance all of that better. So they threw out all the lyrics, all of those weeks of work. Sometimes you throw out great stuff so you can get to the best stuff. Sometimes we have to throw out our great stuff so we can get to God's best stuff. We have to stop worshiping the idol in the mirror and trust in God's promises. And sometimes, as Moses says to Aaron, we've got to let go of the bull. Couldn't have said it better. Amen.